structured data ecosystems can benefit the efforts towards advancing our Africa food systems. That's the conversation we'd like to have. And with me today is Dr. Ben Kwasi. A round of applause, please. He is, I trust most of us would be familiar with his work, but for the benefit of those who do not, uh, Dr. Ben, if you would indulge me, I'm sort of going against his kind request, but uh, Doctor, we cannot just have you here and we don't uh, give the proper introduction. I think it would be, it would not be very honoring of us. So um, I'll just read a little bit. Um, he's an international expert in smallholder digital agriculture and it's the inter intersection of digital in innovations for agriculture, data infrastructure, business development and the enabling environment. He believes very strongly in collaboration, which is a word that we have been hearing and will continue to hear. He's a believer in collaboration and partnership for development. He believes in long-term, future-oriented and resilient models for development, and is a huge advocate for holistic approach to development interventions. There's so much more that I can tell you, but I will maybe just mention one last thing. He's had over 20 years experience combining senior leadership from managerial to technical to research and anal analytics, and some of the great things that he's done uh, that I'm very keen to pick up his mind on is a report that was written for the 2018-2019. I know you're familiar with what I'm speaking. I think it's, it, it bears uh, a lot of relevance to our conversation today, and, and I hope we'll be jumping into that. Um, for those who are not familiar with, don't worry, we shall get into it. And he is highly interested in particular areas that he works. So when it comes to digital agriculture innovations, big data and analytics, innovative business models, enabling environments, um, resource mobilization, strategic planning, and so on and so forth. Today's discussion is about data, okay? And what I find most curious uh, is, Doctor, if we just jump in straight, is Doctor says, we have a mess of a situation. I do not know if you all agree, but uh, first of all, help me welcome Dr. Kwasi Ben. Hello. Okay, okay. Thank you, Sam. Um, my pleasure to be here this afternoon. I know it's been a long walk to the lunch venue and back, so I'm sure some of you are tired. If you are tired, just get up, because we want it to be interactive. That's why I'm not using slide. So again, thank you, Sam, for, for the opportunity to have this conversation. I wish we have an hour, at least an hour, to, to have this conversation, but we don't have. So I will not rush. I'll take my time. I'm here the whole week. So let's have a conversation. I'm speaking to you as leaders, African leaders, okay? And I'm speaking to you, some of you as youth. I believe there are some youth here thinking of future, not today. That's what, so leaders that think of the future, not today. I'm talking to you from that perspective. So Sam said, I, I said earlier that our data systems, data systems in our countries are in a mess. That is true, because I can get confirmation from a number of you. Okay, so you know the story. Maybe, maybe tell us a bit of the story. Yes. What makes you say it's in a mess? So I'll remind, I'll remind them, because you know, you know the story, that if you go to our countries, I'm from Ghana, if you go to our countries, there are multiple stakeholders operating in the agricultural sector in our countries. And almost each one of them has some kind of agricultural data in their system, whether in Excel form, database, on paper, whatever format, whatever size, whatever duration they've been collecting the data. They all have data systems, databases data in, you know, their possession. And when I talk about agricultural data, I talk about two groups. The data for content, like agronomic data, soil data, weather data, market data, that's for content. And then the user data, 
is data about the individuals, the farmers, or the entities, or agribusinesses. Profile them. So you have user data sitting in these databases and content data. For example, just take one commodity in Ghana, those who are from Ghana. If you take cocoa in Ghana, you go to Ghana Cocoa Board, they have invested in data, cocoa data over the years. You go to Cocoa Research Institute in Ghana, huge you know, source of data. Then the private sector guys like Olam and others that are operating Nestle in the country, they have data on cocoa. But every day, we still go to collect that data. And you know who is suffering? Our farmers. Our farmers are suffering. They are the ones that, you know, are tired of, you know, sitting with you every day, giving you data. So that is the mess. That is the mess that I'm talking about. It's, there's nothing wrong with duplicated data systems if they talk to each other. There's nothing wrong. You can, you know, cross-check and validate and... But if the data systems are sitting in isolation and they don't talk to each other, that is a problem. Because you have the data, somebody may know that you have it, but probably because of institutional policies you can't share, or because it's your big business data you can't share, that person will also go and collect the same data. You know the cost of data collection. So that is the mess. That is the situation we have in our countries. Just take one of those commodities multiply it by all kinds of commodities that we have and the data systems that we have. So for me, that's the situation we have. If somebody disagrees, we don't have time to talk about it. We can talk about it later. Okay, but I wanted to ask uh, if I may have a follow-up. What's the impact of that situation on the smallholder farmer? So, so that's what I said earlier. So the farmers are tired. We, everybody is going to them to collect data. And I was talking to another one of your team members earlier. And he said, the farmers, they, when they go down, the farmers say, look, you know, some of your colleagues just came and I gave them the same data. Why do you come back to me? And they don't see the value of the data coming back to them. So this is a story I don't need to tell you, especially those of you who are in the agricultural sector. So the impact on the smallholder farmer, the time that they would take to go to the farm, they sit down to talk to researchers, NGOs, you know, digital platform operators who come to them to collect data every day. And they are not getting the benefit out of the data that, yeah, 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 yeah. The policy implications, so I work for the Commonwealth Secretariat, and we deal with countries. So my role is an advisor, so I advise countries. This is a policy issue that we are taking. The policy implication of this is that if our countries don't take action now, when I say our countries, I don't mean only the public sector, multi-stakeholder approach, both the private and the public. If we don't take action now, the implication of this is going to be huge in the next five, 10 years when we are on retirement. <laughs> I have some gray hair. I, I went to Baba, so you think I'm a young guy. I'm not a young guy, but when we go on retirement, by the time we go on retirement, the implication of this for our countries is going to be huge because your data, the data of Tanzania, will be sitting somewhere outside Tanzania in a private sector database somewhere because there was no regulation here when that private sector guy was collecting the data. And at that time, they'll come back to you and tell you that, look, if you pay, we will give you analytics. We will give you intelligence. Because we have collected data for the last 10 years across the country. Mm. And we know what's going to be the next. So that is why we need to take action. Very good. If I may give an image to that from the discussion we had a bit earlier. If someone wants to, you had that, maybe if you could speak to that. If someone wants to, Ghana, you have gold. So if someone wants to mine gold, they'll, they can't just start digging. But when it comes to data, for some reason, people can just come and collect data and do as they will. 
Would you speak to that a little bit? Sure, sure. So, so we have a framework. The Commonwealth has a framework that we are trying to advise member states to take to better manage their agricultural data at country level. And it's, it's from that we had that conversation. So everybody says data is the new oil or the new gold, right? That's what everybody says. There are all kinds of interpretation for that. But if Ghana has gold, Ghana mines gold, Ghana has, and then some oil now. You can't just go to Ghana now and start mining the gold or the oil. You either need to use the infrastructure that is put in place in Ghana to do it, or you get a permit or license to do it. So if data is a new oil, why is it that our countries don't you know, put things in place for people, everybody, I'm not just talking about the private sector, for NGOs, researchers, students, when they go in, they can take permits or they follow infrastructure rules and collect the data. There is none. So we, we, the other part of that is infrastructure in our countries. The other example I do give is roads or railways or ports, airports. They are infrastructure. If you are a transport operator and you come to this country, you are not going to build your own roads. The road is constructed. You come with a fleet of buses and you run your business. You pay road tax. You follow the regulations. And then the government takes that to maintain the road. In our countries, data as a resource, there's no infrastructure. So everybody goes, is building their own infrastructure. So that is a mess because imagine everybody comes to this country and start constructing roads. You know, if you're a transport business guy, you come and start constructing your road. You know, that's going to be in a mess. But now that's where we see ourselves, where, you know, data is there. We need it. Everybody needs it. And because there's no infrastructure, when you come, you have to build your own infrastructure and start collecting data. So that is... That is the infrastructure part, and that leads to our... Yes, if you could, actually. So what we're going to do for the next couple of minutes, and at the end of this, I would want to jump very quickly into interactions on your end. And again, I want to remind you that's the intention. So at the end of these four steps, you'll be asked, would this work in your country? And we need you to courageously say yes or I don't think so. So your free opinion is very open here. So please walk us through, there's a proposal around what that infrastructure would look like. It has four pillars to it. Talk us through that, and then let's get into a discussion on that. So, so this is an advice that we are trying to take to our member states. We're going to have a national dialogue on this in Malawi from 26, 27, 28th of September, this month. So if you are from Malawi, please see me when we are done. And Ghana likely, from December. the 7th, 8th, and 9th of November. So we have a framework that has four components. So we are saying that our countries need national infrastructure for data in general, but starting from agricultural data, a national infrastructure. And when we talk about that, we're not talking about data center, technical, you know, in a room somewhere. No, that's not what we are talking about a national infrastructure for agricultural data. And it consists of four components. The first one is the policy part, the regulation, the data principles and in the country. Most of our countries, we have data policies, but we don't enforce it. But we need to. Those countries without data policies for the agricultural sector need to put in place. If you are a foreign company and you come to our country, you collect farmers' data, who owns that data? How do you treat the data? How do you protect the data? You know, access, privacy, protection, all kinds of things. Standards need to apply to that data. So that's a policy. You know, the private sector, for example, if they know there's a policy, they are comfortable to operate. But if they 
they are scared because they know that their investment can fall into the drain tomorrow if one government moves and another one comes. You know, so the policy is key. We have, our countries have, but we need to put it together and we need to enforce it. That's one. The second part is the technology. So the technology part of this infrastructure is that we already have data systems. So we have too much data in our countries. All that we need is to manage it. All that we need is to better manage the data. So the technology part is not to centralize the data. We need a technology that acts like an apex, you know, Again, let's have infrastructure in mind. The data systems that we are talking of, they are not infrastructure, they are data systems. They are service you know, solutions. Because if you have data for market information, your interest is to provide market information. But the technology that we are talking about is above all data systems in the country, able to pull data from these data systems when the data systems are open. So this technology is able to pull data from multiple data systems, harmonize them, create added value to everybody. That's the second one. I can explain each one of these for 30 minutes, but we don't have the time. So the, the third one is the governance. So, so, just, so just for clarity, for the technology, we know that the information and the data is all over the place, but to standardize how that is harmonized, that is the yes. technology part. Okay. Yes, because as I said earlier, farmers, have identities in these platforms. And one farmer is registered in three, four platforms. You know, I'll register with you as Benjamin Adom, another Ben Adom, another Kwasi Adom, another, you know. So the same Ben Adom has different identities in these platforms. This technology is, should be able to harmonize that user identity that is duplicated in five platforms in the country to create a single profile for the farmer, which creates value, added value for the farmer. Because I, I work with an organization, I have a salary, the bank, they know my salary, so they push me to come for loan. But the farmer doesn't have that, that kind of profile. And if we are able to harmonize that profile for the farmer, it creates value for the farmer to also get loan from the banks. But if the farmer's profile is duplicated, you know, a cocoa farmer, a vegetable farmer, the same farmer that grows a number of crops, you know, if they are combined together, you see the value that it will create for the banks or credit companies to know that, oh, this, this, I can trust this farmer and give loan. Okay. You know, so that is, that is the harmonization above all the existing data systems. So we have policy, we have technology, technology. and the third one is? The third one is administration or regulation. If you put that kind of national infrastructure in place, who should be the regulator? So this is sensitive. Who should be the administrator? You know, we, we don't recommend, we recommend our public sector, our government to drive the process. This process that we are talking about, government should drive the process. But the infrastructure, should not be owned, I wouldn't say owned, should not be supervised. Yeah, supervised by the one public sector, like the government. Otherwise, the private sector is not open their, going to open their data system to that. They have paid and collected the data already. So we are saying that a data trustee system, an independent entity, a neutral entity, or a multi-stakeholder entity that represents all stakeholders in the country should be the regulator, so a trustee, you know, financial trustee, how they operate. They don't have vested interest in, in the money. They take money from you, you bring your money, and then they make, they give to other people, they get interest and give back to you. So that regulator is playing that role because they are not going to provide service to anybody. But they are going to apply the regulations and policies that have been agreed upon the technology that has been identified to manage the data on behalf of the data contributors, all those who are contributing data into this infrastructure. That is the third one. And then the final one is the business part. But who pays for this? <laughs> you know, most of the time we do forget about it. Who pays for this? 
So financing and how do we sustain it? Those are the two parts of who pays for it. So you need to identify who is going to finance it. It's an infrastructure. It's maybe the World Bank, you know, AFDB, those things. They, all of us has to think of that infrastructure. It's not a service. It's an infrastructure that we are putting in place to enable service providers to build their innovations on. So somebody can, but the Commonwealth Secretariat is speaking to some organizations that are interested in financing what they call DPI, Digital Public Infrastructure. If you search for it, you come across it, DPI. It's one of these sexy terms that everybody is you know, being driven into DPI, DPI. So Digital Public Infrastructure. So we have you know, adapted it to agricultural data, that our countries need DPI for agricultural data. So some of these financing organizations are interested that, look, if the demand is coming from Tanzania, we will come and help finance it. But we're not going to bring everything. We want commitment from both public and private, and we come in with expertise and some money, help you build. That's the first part. The second part is how do you sustain it? So we, we are saying that part of the data that is going to be in the infrastructure has to be open. I know there are a lot of advocates for open data. So there should be open part of the data, but some part needs to be protected. You can't put farmers' you know, information in the infrastructure and open it to everybody to access. No, you need to protect it. And those that you protect, you monetize. You create value out of it. If, if, if a fertilizer manufacturing company, you know, Yara is on this. If Yara based in you know, Europe somewhere is interested in the market in Tanzania, you know how much they pay to get all those data? So much data. Assuming they can get that you know, at national level, to know the market size of farmers, the distribution of the farmers, the salt, the pest situation, to be able to factor, to manufacture fertilizer to meet the interests of your country. You know how much they pay? They will subscribe to this infrastructure to, to pay and get that data instead of doing feasibility studies, sending people to the ground to collect those data. If they can subscribe, they will pay. You know. So you need that kind of business model. Let's, let's take as many comments as we can in, in three minutes. Thank you I'm so much. I'm going to attempt to run, run, run. <laughs> OK. Your name and brief comment or question. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lucy Komen from Kenya. I am in warehousing and I appreciate this uh, digital ID. It is timely, but um, my major question is one, we will be getting in pharma data. How will we handle issues data security? You've also talked about open data, and you've also talked about uh, secure data. In terms of open data, and uh, we are going to the, the age of AI, how do we handle it? Thank you. OK, very good. Um, I see one yeah. in front. I'm coming. <laughs> so do uh, you want to respond a little? Yeah, to the two of them are talking about ID. So, yes. So, so we know the technology has both negative and positive, right? It depends on how you use it. We are, the digital IDs are already being duplicated. Everybody is profiling our farmers. Don't be scared if government, you know, goes to do it. But what we are saying is, if you have national ID in Uganda, right? Yes. yes. So that is the beginning. So what we are saying is, the national ID is going to be the foundation of the DPI that we are talking about. Okay, so you only customize it for farmers. But again, it depends on the regulator. If you have an independent regulator that is respected by everybody, both the public and, you know, they're not going to use that data against anybody. Government still has sovereignty. Let's not, let's not forget about that. Government still has sovereignty over that you know, regulator. But regulator has its responsibilities how to, to protect. release that to the government if needed. Okay. You know, so 
Yeah, and then the AI, I don't want to talk about it because, <laughs> because AI, you know, my, my argument is that AI is a technology. It survives on data. If you don't have the good data, AI is going to give you all kinds of things, you know. So if we have good data infrastructure, then we will see, you know, the impact of AI in our countries. Thank you so much. I'm going to attempt to speed up the conversation. I'd like us to take five minutes. So again, quick comment. Uh, I want you to be as informal. If you, if you want to come, just please come with your comment. There's a, there's a microphone yeah. here, yes. please. If you want to move closer, move closer so we can hear you out. You can break protocol, please. Let's get the comments. Please come. Get closer to the mic. Give the comments so that we can hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just asking that yes, uh, we have these regulators to most of African countries, the Bureau of Statistics. Yes. And then that is where they manage our data for agriculture and everything in the country. And uh, I happen to work with the CADAP. And uh, we have Academia 2063, they manage the agriculture data. So how do this infrastructure will be harmonized together and give us one data. If you say Tanzania, when you find it in the EBR, you find it in the Bureau of Statistics to be the same. Thank you so much. One okay. Here and then I'll come you know what? I'm going to break protocol. Uh, Dr. Ben, I'm leaving you up here. This is uh, obviously a passion point for all of us. So let's get as many very quickly and I'll be here with the other mic. Please. Okay. Um, Just yeah, I, one, I, one yeah. quick comment, my dear. Yeah, okay, I had the same sentiments, but to add on that, um, I just wanted to also know, um, in terms of new data sets, who is responsible for collection once the infrastructure has been set? And usually, in terms of data, there is always that disconnect between data collection, data dissemination, and also outreach. All so right. how are we going to, to link all that? How are we linking all that? Thank you, Dr. Ben is taking notes. Again, I'm reminding you why this is so critical is because it's an ongoing conversation and you get to weigh in on that. So in a few weeks, Malawi will be having that conversation and, uh, and that continues so quickly, please. Yeah, I'm Tamaskan from Ethiopia. My question is we need many actors to contribute to the data uh, for having integrated data system as a country. Uh, my question is how are we going to incentivize all these contributors for doing these things, and how are we ensure the quality of da the data for better use? Thank you, Thank so you very much. Just these two more, and then two more. Yes, two more. Thank you. Yes. So and, and sorry, uh, if I may interject, if you have a contribution to make and you want it to be added, please write it down. We want to make sure that uh, after today, Dr. Ben represents your input in this as well, because you are some of those decision makers. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so my question goes to Doc, and it's with regards to uh, Ghana specifically. Now, Ghana already has a Data Protection Commission, and uh, I heard him talking about something that is looking very different from what they do now. I want to know from him how they'd be able to synchronize knowing that this already exists. That's the first question. The second question is, he mentioned technology. I want to ask which technology are they considering. Now, the issue I would want to suggest to him is that please <coughs> consider blockchain because blockchain <laughs> is the only system we have now <laughs> that is very cheap that African countries can leverage on to harmonize any form of data. Okay. Don't look at the bad side of uh, what has happened. Yeah. Maybe I can give you some consultancy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> thank you. And lastly, thank you so much. Yeah, so I just want to add to someone talked about the unique data set, uh, which is really, really important. I think agriculture, or when we talk about farmer data, it's not about one single set of data. It can go across the value chain. Yeah. I expect that we will be talking about, you know, basic data, which most countries are already collecting, which is for every citizen to have some identity. Now, building on that, it will be very difficult for you to have one single database for everything from production to processing to marketing data and all that. And I, I think if you can answer that um, challenge, it will be very important for us. 
Very good. Reshma, thank yeah. you. Let me start from that. So, so <laughs> how many minutes do I have? You have two minutes. Two minutes? No. no, no, no. So, so, so we are not saying one single database for everything. No. What we are saying is the existing data systems need to continue running. You need to continue maintaining and updating your data system. We are not saying countries should, you know, bring all their data into one place. No, that's not what we are talking about. That goes back to another question. Who is going to keep the data active? So the existing data systems will have to continue you know, bringing the data back into that infrastructure regularly. So the technology will have some of those features that is able to the frequency of you know, pulling data from different data systems and harmonizing them. I don't have the answer to that, right? I'm not a tech guy, I'm a policy guy. So I don't have answer to that. So when we go to the country, we believe that there are experts in the country and we leave it to the country to determine, okay? So, no, <laughs> I need to. <laughs> so so if, if the systems on the ground will still be collecting the data, the incentive for them, I'm trying to combine all of them. Yes, yes. The incentive for them is that that is the business model. If a fertilizer manufacturing company pays, subscribe and pays, who do you think the money should go to? Should go to the one contributing the data into the infrastructure, not to the government, not to anybody, not to the regulator. The regulator is not owner of the, the, the infrastructure. So those who are keeping the data up to date in the infrastructure, they are the ones that are supposed to get, you know, 10%, you know, 5%, subject to how much data you are contributing. And that is an incentive for you to go every time and collect the data. The advantage is that you have the data, you know, pharma is going to be relieved because you are not going, a student doing research, PhD research, is not going there to a pharma to interview. That will subscribe to that infrastructure and get the data. If it's not able to get everything from that, and then he goes still to the ground to collect the data, the policy says, bring part of that data back to the infrastructure. You know, so that... <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ben, I'm smiling yeah, but, at you. You're, not, you're ignoring... I've not responded to the question. You're, you're ignoring my smile. <laughs> what I'd like us to... Okay, so, so what I'd like us to note, again, the conversation is happening. There are answers. I think the broad discussion is there are answers, and there's a lot of questions. And all of this requires your involvement. So maybe, if I may, if I may, doctor, with all due respect, sir, how do we involve, how do we, how do we make sure our voices are heard in this conversation, especially knowing there's a conversation going to happen in uh, September, in two weeks or so, then in November, as this evolves, how do we get involved so we can be heard? Yeah, so, so that is what we are doing. So the Commonwealth Secretariat, again, we are playing our advising role. We're taking this to the Ministry of Agriculture in our countries, trying you know, for them to understand the importance of this, the policy implication, the policy inaction. If you don't do it, the implication in the next five, 10 years. If they get it, we are, again, we are trying to facilitate initial financing through those who are financing DPI. So if you search for DPI, India, for example, is a champion. They have DPI for you know, identity. They have DPI for payments, you know, all kinds of things. Even Togo, Togo is one of our African countries. Let's not go far away to India and Brazil. Togo built a DPI to support the social services that is being cited everywhere now. So this has result if we do it, if we do it well. So we are calling every member state. So we, we Commonwealth, we have the budget to do it in four countries. Malawi, Ghana, we are luckiest one in Africa. Then we go to Barbados and Bangladesh. Any partner that is interested, any partner that is interested in partnership collaboration, to reduce this duplication and wants to fund this dialogue, in, you know, Tanzania, we are ready to come and support. 
technically. We don't want you to give us money, but you have the money. It's like 40,000 US dollars because we are not supporting anybody from anywhere to come. Just multi-stakeholders to gather three days, discuss this, and come to an agreement that we want to build it. We want to design and build this. And then we can work it, you know, Commonwealth work with you to, to present proposal to these guys to come back and, and help design and build this infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Benjamin Kwasi. A round of applause. Very good. Again, I apologize for rushing you. I know, but we really appreciate the passion and we really appreciate the work that you do. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause even as he takes his seat. All right, so we're going to move on very quickly and into our country. Step in the light, step in the light. Okay, good. We're going to move forward into our country roundtables. Are you ready for that? Our speakers are here. We're going to have, I'm going to show you where each country is going to be. We're going to have two rounds. So there's eight countries specifically represented here. We'll have, if you were in cohort two, similar to what we did the last year, if you're in cohort three, I'll show you very easily. We're going to have a country right here. So on this side of the room, we'll have a country here. We'll have a country down here then up at the top, and then right at the back, in the middle at the back. Okay, so let me walk you through which countries are going first. Naturally, in the same way, we've kind of had to move things along. When you get to the place of discussion, don't hold back your question for the last two minutes, because I know engagement is going to be very strong, especially at the end, so just bring it in as soon as possible. So let me tell you, the first country now, and we'll just go straight into it, so we're gonna have a quick turnaround. We're going to have um, Ethiopia, so with the speaker that's responsible there, and I'd like to invite the moderator who's going to be in that space, will be here. So Ethiopia, down here, we shall have um, Malawi. So what I'm saying is the seats around here. Just find a seat comfortably and move to the country you'd like to engage with. So Malawi, and then at the top we have Rwanda, so middle to the, towards the top, Rwanda, and then at the back here is Ghana. Can I do it one more time? Yes? Okay. Very quickly, Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda, Ghana. For the last time, and you can start moving. Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda, and Ghana. Let's take two minutes or so, so the people who I'm, I'm inviting part of the color team to make sure that the speakers for the rep, uh, different countries are ready and they're there with the teams. In three minutes, we should be starting that conversation. So we'll take 30 minutes, have that conversation, and then we will do a switch for the other four countries, and I'll tell you, let's, let's take as many comments as we can in, in three minutes. Thank you I'm so much. I'm going to attempt to run, run, run. <laughs> okay. Your name and brief comment or question. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lucy Komen from Kenya. I am in warehousing, and I appreciate this uh, digital ID, it is timely, but um, my major question is one, we will be getting in pharma data. How will we handle issues, data security? You've also talked about open data, and you've also talked about uh, secure data. In terms of open data, and uh, we are going to the, the age of AI, how do we handle it? Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, I see one yeah. in front. I'm coming. <laughs> so, like, you want to respond a little? Yeah, to the two of them are talking about ID. So, yes. so, so, <laughs> we know the technology has both negative and positive, right? It depends on how you use it. We are the digital IDs are already being duplicated. Everybody is profiling our farmers. Don't be scared if government, you know, goes to do it. But what we are saying is, if you have national ID in Uganda, right, 
Yes. yes. So that is the beginning. So what we are saying is the national ID is going to be the foundation of the DPI that we are talking about. Okay, so you only customize it for farmers. But again, it depends on the regulator. If you have an independent regulator that is respected by everybody, both the public and, you know, they're not going to use that data against anybody. Government still has sovereignty. Let's not, let's not forget about that. Government still has sovereignty over that, you know, regulator. But regulator has its responsibilities how to, to protect. release that to the government if needed. Okay. You know, so, yeah. And then the AI, I don't want to talk about it because, <laughs> because AI, you know, my, my argument is that AI is a technology. It survives on data. If you don't have the good data, AI is going to give you all kinds of things. You know, so if we have good data infrastructure, then we will see you know, the impact of AI in our countries. Thank you so much. I'm going to attempt to speed up the conversation. I'd like us to take five minutes. So again, quick comment. Uh, I want you to be as informal. If you, if you want to come, just please come with your comment. There's a, there's a microphone yeah. here, yes. please. If you want to move closer, move closer so we can hear you out. You can break protocol, please. Let's get the comments. Please come. Get closer to the mic. Give the comments so that we can hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just asking that yes, uh, we have these regulators to most of African countries, the Bureau of Statistics. Yes. And then that is where they manage our data for agriculture and everything in the country. And uh, I happen to work with the CADAP. And uh, we have Academia 2063, they manage the agriculture data. So how do this infrastructure will be harmonized together and give us one data? If you say Tanzania, when you find it in the EBR, you find it in the Bureau of Statistics to be the same. Thank you so much. One okay. here and then I'll come you know what, I'm going to break protocol. Uh, Dr. Ben, I'm leaving you up here. This is uh, obviously a passion point for all of us. So let's get as many very quickly, and I'll be here with the other mic. Please. Okay. Um, Just yeah, I, one, I, one yeah. quick comment, my dear. Yeah, okay. I had the same sentiments, but to add on that, um, I just wanted to also know, um, in terms of new data sets, who is responsible for collection once the infrastructure has been set? And usually, in terms of data, there is always that disconnect between data collection, data dissemination, and also outreach. All so right. So how are we going to, to link all that? How are we linking all that? Thank you, Dr. Ben, is taking notes. Again, I'm reminding you why this is so critical is because it's an ongoing conversation and you get to weigh in on that. So in a few weeks, Malawi will be having that conversation and, uh, and that continues. So quickly, please. Yeah, I'm Tamaskan from Ethiopia. My question is, we need many actors to contribute to the data uh, for having integrated data system as a country. Uh, my question is, how are we going to incentivize all these contributors for doing these things? And how are we ensure the quality of da the data for better use? Thank you, Thank so you very much. Two more and then... Two more, yes, two more, thank you. Yes, so and, and sorry, uh, if I may interject. If you have a contribution to make and you want it to be added, please write it down. We want to make sure that uh, after today, Dr. Ben represents your input in this as well, because you are some of those decision makers, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my question goes to Doc, and it's with, with regards to uh, Ghana specifically. Now, Ghana already has a data protection commission and uh, I heard him talking about something that is looking very different from what they do now. I want to know from him how they'd be able to synchronize knowing that this already exists. That's the first question. The second question is, he mentioned technology. I want to ask which technology are they considering? Now, the issue I would want to suggest to him is that, please, <coughs> Consider blockchain, because blockchain <laughs> is the only system we have now that is very cheap that African countries can leverage on to harmonize any form of data. Okay. Don't look at the bad side of uh, what has happened. Yeah. Maybe I can give you some consultancy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Thank you. 
And okay. lastly, thank you so much. Yeah, so I just want to add to someone talked about the unique data set, uh, which is really, really important. I think agriculture, or when we talk about farmer data, it's not about one single set of data. It can go across the value chain. Yeah. I expect that we will be talking about, you know, basic data, which most countries are already collecting, which is for every citizen to have some identity. Now, building on that, it will be very difficult for you to have one single database for everything from production to processing to marketing data and all that. And I, I think if you can answer that um, challenge, it will be very important for us. Very good. Reshma, thank yeah. you. Let me start from that. So, so <laughs> how many minutes do I have? You have two minutes. Two minutes? No. No, no, no. So, so, so we are not saying one single database for everything. No. What we are saying is the existing data systems need to continue running. You need to continue maintaining and updating your data system. We are not saying countries should, you know, bring all their data into one place. No, that's not what we are talking about. That goes back to another question, who is going to keep the data active? So the existing data systems will have to continue you know, bringing the data back into that infrastructure regularly. So the technology will have some of those features that is able to, the frequency of you know, pulling data from different data systems and harmonizing them. I don't have the answer to that, right? I'm not a tech guy, I'm a policy guy. So I don't have answer to that. So when we go to the country, we believe that there are experts in the country and we leave it to the country to determine, okay? So, no, <laughs> I need to. <laughs> so so if, if the systems on the ground will still be collecting the data, the incentive for them, I'm trying to combine all of them. Yes, yes. The incentive for them is that that is the business model. If a fertilizer manufacturing company pays, subscribe and pays, who do you think the money should go to? Should go to the one contributing the data into the infrastructure, not to the government, not to anybody, not to the regulator. The regulator is not owner of the, the, the infrastructure. So those who are keeping the data up to date in the infrastructure, they are the ones that are supposed to get, you know, 10%, you know, 5%, subject to how much data you are contributing. And that is an incentive for you to go every time and collect the data. The advantage is that you have the data, you know, pharma is going to be relieved because you are not going, a student doing research, PhD research, is not going there to a farmer to interview. That will subscribe to that infrastructure and get the data. If it's not able to get everything from that, and then he goes still to the ground to collect the data, the policy says bring part of that data back to the infrastructure. You know, so that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ben, I'm smiling no, at you. I'm you're not, you're ignoring. I'm not to the you're, you're ignoring my smile. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like us to. Okay, so, so what I'd like us to note, again, the conversation is happening. There are answers. I think the broad discussion is there are answers, and there's a lot of questions. And all of this requires your involvement. So maybe, if I may, if I may, doctor, with all due respect, sir, how do we involve, how do we, how do we make sure our voices are heard in this conversation, especially knowing there's a conversation going to happen in uh, September, in two weeks or so, then in November. As this evolves, how do we get involved so we can be heard? Yeah, so, so that is what we are doing. So the Commonwealth Secretariat, again, we are playing our advising role. We're taking this to the Ministry of Agriculture in our countries, trying you know, for them to understand the importance of this, the policy implication, the policy inaction. If you don't do it, the implication in the next five, 10 years. If they get it, we are, again, we are trying to facilitate initial financing through those who are financing DPI. So if you search for DPI, India, for example, is a champion. They have DPI for you know, identity. They have DPI for payments, you know, all kinds of things. Even Togo, Togo is one of our African countries. 
let's not go far away to India and Brazil. Togo built a DPI to support the social services that is being cited everywhere now. So this has result if we do it, if we do it well. So we are calling every member state. So we, we, Commonwealth, we have the budget to do it in four countries. Malawi, Ghana, we are luckiest one in Africa. Then we go to Barbados and Bangladesh. Any partner that is interested, any partner that is interested in partnership collaboration to reduce this duplication and wants to fund this dialogue, in, you know, Tanzania, we are ready to come and support, technically. We don't want you to give us money, but you have the money. It's like 40,000 US dollars, because we are not supporting anybody from anywhere to come. Just multi-stakeholders to gather three days, discuss this, and come to an agreement that we want to build it. We want to design and build this. And then we can work it, you know, Commonwealth work with you to, to present proposal to these guys to come back and, and help design and build this infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Benjamin Kwasi. A round of applause. Very good. Again, I apologize for rushing you. I know, but we really appreciate the passion and we really appreciate the work that you do. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause even as he takes his seat. All right, so we're going to move on very quickly and into our country. Step in the light, step in the light. Okay, good. We're going to move forward into our country roundtables. Are you ready for that? Our speakers are here. We're going to have, I'm going to show you where each country is going to be. We're going to have two rounds. So there's eight countries specifically represented here. We'll have, if you were in cohort two, similar to what we did the last year, if you're in cohort three, I'll show you very easily. We're going to have a country right here. So on this side of the room, we'll have a country here. We'll have a country down here then up at the top, and then right at the back, in the middle at the back. Okay, so let me walk you through which countries are going first. Naturally, in the same way, we've kind of had to move things along. When you get to the place of discussion, don't hold back your question for the last two minutes, because I know engagement is going to be very strong, especially at the end, so just bring it in as soon as possible. So let me tell you, the first country now, and we'll just go straight into it, so we're gonna have a quick turnaround. We're going to have um, Ethiopia, so with the speaker that's responsible there, and I'd like to invite the moderator who's going to be in that space, will be here. So Ethiopia, down here, we shall have um, Malawi. So what I'm saying is the seats around here. Just find a seat comfortably and move to the country you'd like to engage with. So Malawi, and then at the top we have Rwanda, so middle to the, towards the top, Rwanda, and then at the back here is Ghana. Can I do it one more time? Yes? Okay. Very quickly, Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda, Ghana. For the last time, and you can start moving. Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda, and Ghana. Let's take two minutes or so, so the people who I'm, I'm inviting part of the color team to make sure that the speakers for the rep, uh, different countries are ready and they're there with the teams. In three minutes, we should be starting that conversation. So we'll take 30 minutes, have that conversation, and then we will do a switch for the other four countries, and I'll tell you where those four countries will be so you can move accordingly. Again, I'll, I guess I can do it one more time. Ethiopia, yes. I... <laughs> Thank you, Team Uganda. Uh, you guys. Uh, <laughs> I can tell we are very good friends now. By the time someone says, go away. <laughs> okay. So in 30 seconds, so one team says go away, another one is smiling intensely, trying to bribe their way into three more minutes. Okay? We should be done. This is me being extremely gracious. One minute. One minute. We really need to close this. 
and get into the last element of our day. So in about 30 seconds, we're going to turn on the music, and then while we're up here, Reshma is going to walk us through some exercises, some tiny, tiny energizer type thing. Um, Reshma, you are, are, you, are you a yoga instructor? I know you do all sorts of... Yeah, you can... You can... Are you sure? You want all of us to get into a yoga practice right now? Try balance. We're going to see how well we can balance. We're going to see how well we can. But ba what does that mean? Balance, like yeah, on one. Yeah, we'll see how well we're doing. We can see how well. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Team Uganda. Was the first to finish. A round of applause for them. If, even if they said go away. <laughs> Team. K oh, there you go. Team Nigeria. Round of applause. Well done. Well done. A big clap, ah, Team Kenya. Everyone get up on your feet. Everyone up, up, up. Up, 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 up. Everyone, 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 everyone. Up, up, up. I miss the DJ. Come on, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me. Push the volume. Come on, come on. Put those hands together like this. Whatever, whatever Reshma does, you do. Everyone, here we go. Put those bags down, put those bags it's down. It's the kids, baby. Move forward, move forward to the front seat. Okay, can I give you a Okay, high five your partner. Oh, okay, swing and high five. Okay, here we go. So, you guys know we like to be a bit spontaneous, right? Yeah. So, can I get, that was a really nice song, Mr. DJ. Can I get a more crazy song, like, like, like crazy, I don't know if you have like Banner Boy or something, I don't know, like, these people are not very corporate, they know all these guys. So, like, some crazy song, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to declare, let me, I'm going to apologize now, just so you don't look at me badly. And I'm going to come down and pick any random person, and I'll bring you up here, and whatever you do, we do. Done. Are you ready? The doors are closed, so you can't get out. <laughs> Can I hear that jump? Play that song, play that song. Nantongo, come here. My friend from Uganda. A round of applause. Let's start with my friend from Uganda. Put those hands together. Come on. Hey, hey. Quickly, I'm coming down for you. Hey, hey, hey. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know, I know, I know. Here we go. Join Reshma, join Reshma. Whatever she does, we do. Here we go. Hey. All right. Okay. Hey. Wow. Hey. Yo, this is a bit complicated. Okay, what's happening here? <laughs> Put your hands together. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. This is like some ballet practice. And just to let you know, we are recording everything on video. So the people you left back home will be sent a copy. So let me go down and pick someone else. Here we go. Stop running from me. Yeah. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> Come on, 
Michael, everyone put a round of applause for Michael. Get up there, get up there. Whatever you do, we do. All right? Can I have more volume on that? Watch Michael. Yeah. Hey. All right, all right. I like it, I like it, I like it a lot. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Some people have removed their shoes already. <laughs> you should have seen her when I picked her up. Come, come, hey, 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 hey. A round of applause. I'll apologize later. Here we go. Here we go. What? Do whatever she does, you do. Hey. Oh, this one. I've done this before. From Rwanda. Just so you know, I'm bringing up very high level people. <laughs> Whatever. A round of applause. And this will be the last one. No, stay here. Whatever he does, oh. Follow, everyone. Come on. Come on. Ah, you guys. Corporate dances, you guys. Okay. This is like practice for balancing. <laughs> A round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Ah, all right. That was nice. Okay. So we are going to do one last thing. We want to take the next uh, 30 minutes or so to hear from a special group of people. Last year when we met in Kigali, we had two groups. We had, um, we had uh, cohort one and cohort two. And I think it was already mentioned at the time, all the cohort one guys were like, ah, we are the seniors. You know, like in school, <laughs> we're the seniors and these are the juniors. Now we have cohort two and we have cohort three. So what's going to happen now? We thought it would be very meaningful to hear from their experience. So these guys are the part of the like, first round of alumni. So they've s finished the 16 months process. They've had the structured training. They've had the coaching sessions. They've had the, these kinds of interactions online and face-to-face. -face. They've been doing their ALPs, the ones that we were kind of looking at this morning. So we thought we would have a discussion and hear from them what's their experience been like, how have they benefited, and we know that this can encourage those of you who are in the middle of your projects, um, cohort two, and also cohort three, which is just starting. I was talking to, I think, Prince from Ghana. Please wave at me. Where is Prince? Prince, you, you know, Prince, I should have brought you up here to dance. Maybe we can do that. Maybe. Do you think we should? Yeah? We just stay here? No, Prince, you come, 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 come. Round of applause for Prince. Come, 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 come. And just so we are balanced in the, you know, gender inclusivity, so. <laughs> yes, you, come. A round of applause. Mr. DJ, you refuse to play me something from Banner Boy. I'm going to ask you to play it back. So, a nice dance. Now, for you, you're just entertaining us. So you're like the, the queen dancer. <laughs> <laughs> the king dancer. All right? So I'm going to give us 30 seconds. Everyone up on your feet. One more round. Come on. It's, come on. Come on. Come on. One more round. 30 seconds. One more round. Are you ready, sir? Pump it up, sir. So where do we start? Ladies first or? The men. The men. Oh, now you want the men to go first. Hey. hey. You, are you, okay. He's already starting. Uh-huh. Okay, 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 here we go. Hey, okay, okay. All right, this is Terminator. Hey, yo, this is getting complicated. Prince, this, which card, this is Ghana, eh? These are Ghana dances. Hey. Hey. 
this guy. Mr. DJ, did you have a conversation with him? He seems too ready, okay? Okay, okay? <laughs> Okay, Prince, 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 okay, okay, okay. Well done, well done, well done. And lastly, please. Blessing. Blessing. Mr. DJ. Blessing represents team what? All the way from? All the way from Nigeria. My brother, you can't play that ballad, eh? She's from Nigeria. Play something Afro beats. Are you ready? <laughs> Mr. DJ, give me a thumbs up. Give me a what? I can't hear you. A what? Are you ready? And don't dance those simple dances for us, eh? We want Nigerian. <laughs> you can feel free to ashamed yourself. <laughs> By the way, we are recording all of this. It's going to be on the YouTube channel. We shall get many subscribers. Ah, wait, this. Ah, ah. You guy, fast way, fast way. Hey. Okay, here we go. All right. Blessings follow my yard. Blessings stay for my yard. Uh -huh. And like a dad, you then move your waist. You go feel like move your waist. The blessings At the bio, you are dancing too much. I can see you. Blessings follow my yard. That's why I set fire go on. I don't want to raise my things no more. I don't want to go back to where I did before. One more, one more, one more. Stress me not to stop me, cha cha cha. I set fire go on. I don't want to raise my things no more. I don't want to. Find someone and high five them. And high five. And high five. And high five. Oh, round of applause for blessing. Round of applause for blessing. <laughs> okay, okay, so you can now have your seats. I just needed to get you to exercise a bit extra. Okay? So let me get back to my. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our DJ. Thank you so much. Ah, guys, a big round of applause for our DJ. Yes, we appreciate you, sir. Okay, so back to the conversation. We're going to have 30 minutes. What we want to find out, I already mentioned, what's been their experience, what have they learned, what mistakes did they make, if you can kindly share that, and how can we learn from your own journey, whether we're in cohort two, we're in the middle of the process, or we're just beginning. The reason I brought Prince up was because he told me he met one of you on the plane, and he, he said, ah, I got all my answers. I grilled him. I asked him, how do you balance? How intensive is the thing? How busy is it? And all those things. So today, this is the conversation we want to have. Let me take my seat, and I'll let you know who we have on our panel today. So we have um, country team leader, Kilimo Trust, Uganda. She's the country... Uh, Uganda Country Chapter Leader, Rachel Ojambo. We have the Managing Director, El Giga Farms, Ghana, Stephen Debre. We have, now this one is a powerful one. We have Deputy Commissioner, Corp Development Ministry for Cooperatives and Small and Medium Enterprises, State Department for Corp, Kenya. Hey, you people, that's a powerful title. You had better clap. We have uh, Managing Director, Kilimo General Business Limited, Rwanda. That's Francois. Thank you, Francois. Nsegi Yumva. We, have, we also have um, Senior National Development Planning Specialist, National Planning Commission, all the way from Malawi, Tayam, Tayani Banda. Very good. Um, and then lastly, we have Country Project Manager, Mennonites Economic Development Associate, Associates, Nigeria, Grace Fossen. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is have a quick fire. Um, just to get started, any one of you can start. What has this experience been like? Uh, there's a, there should be a microphone somewhere along the way here. You could start, yes. What has this, at the end of 16 months, what has this been like for you? Yes, it's working. Um, thank you, um, Sam. Good evening, uh, cohort two and cohort three. And uh, good evening, my uh, fellow elders on the panel. You know, as we are called the elders. <laughs> um, like I've been introduced, my name is Rachel Ajambo. I work with the Kelemo Trust. And uh, we were the first people to start um, the color program. Uh, I remember it was um, the month of August, and uh, we had just come out of the of the lockdown in Uganda uh, of COVID, and uh, we started. It was quite um, overwhelming in the beginning, and uh, we quickly realized with my winning team my team was called the winning team, that uh, we had to pull together. So because of the restrictions that time on COVID, what we did is uh, we started congregating together, physically. So that is tip number one. Make every effort to congregate together in your teams. You will get a lot of work done in a short time. So I was the host. Uh, in Bugolobi, for those of you that come from Uganda. And uh, I would invite everybody over for a cup of tea. And then we would find some G-nuts or whatever, cake or, or something like this. And uh, it, it, it would be enjoyable. And we would go through all that uh, coursework, especially your, your special project, your action learning project. That one needs work. And it's a bit difficult to do it if you're all spread and you're not meeting together. It is difficult to get done. So what has my experience been? I graduated together with my team um, in December uh, 2022. And uh, personally, it has been a, a very enriching learning experience especially the learnings on uh, environment, sustainable environmental management course, the EMS course, and the course on agroecology. Those two courses for me um, were very, very um, eye-opening. They were also among the most difficult, actually, to, to finish um, and uh, pass. Um, but it was enriching because since that time, um, I have developed me and my team, I, I lead the team, country teams, and uh, we have developed two programs that are now funded, especially to deal with the issue of climate change adaptation. Um, and another thing, this afternoon, actually, I was invited uh, to be part of the FAO um, USDA uh, panel on climate change resilience and how to make a uh, public policy and government budgeting, climate smarter. If I had not gone through those two courses, I wouldn't really have the points um, to be able to contribute meaningfully to such a global discussion. So uh, FAO, with, uh, funded by Gates Foundation, they've developed uh, tools that help governments to track expenditure and how much they are spending on climate change adaptation through their budgets, the existing budgets. So for me, the, the color program has been very, very enriching professionally and personally. I now get to sit on panels. I, I get to write articles. I've so far now published two articles on climate change adaptation, and uh, I'm continuing to do so. Yeah, very good. So please, for those of you who are not yet sure what is this about. These people, they ask for a lot of time. They, they take a lot of my time. I'm busy and things like this. Please be serious. <laughs> OK. Hey. Thank you. Please, three words. Please be. This is a serious woman, for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. 
Steven, what was your experience like? Then, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. The Cal experience has been a very enriching experience. Um, throughout all the courses, uh, the interaction, um, the trainings, the, uh, the, the mentorship, and the coaching. Um, through Color program, leadership program, you get to experience the three C's that he has been emphasizing. You connect, you collaborate, and you contribute. If you don't do these three things, you miss out on the experience. Um, for me, um, if I was looking at this and, and, and to, do some, to do it again, I would look at uh, trying to do more of the courses. And um, the earlier you start, the better. Um, if you push them towards the end, you finish the compulsory courses, but um, you end up missing the other than compulsory courses, which are very, actually, equally good. Um, I end, for example, for me, I ended up um, picking out uh, courses that I never did, just downloading them so that I should study them on my own because after I learned, I realized that um, although these courses are not very difficult to come to, to, to do, I mean to get, go through them, but they're actually very enriching. And in a few minutes or 15 minutes, you get so much information, packed with information, and you learn a lot. And um, as much as possible, do. And uh, as an uh, alumni, we actually asked, okay, can you open up this for, uh, learning um, academy for us as well, so that we continue learning, because we realize there's so much to learn uh, from this um, um, uh, training course. So we have now, we're happy that we have the academy, we can access it, but it's good that you do the courses within uh, that you're training, so that you complement with the other packages, for example, the, the coaching, um, uh, the, the collaboration, and you apply them in your ALP and all that. So for me, it has been a very, very rich experience. And um, there's more that I'll say. Maybe I'll give, give another chance, or so I'll talk more when um, I'll get to the next chance. Thank you. OK. That's good. OK, yeah. Stephen, sir, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief on my. If, if, sorry, if I could have uh, another microphone for the three delegates down. Yes. Yeah, so I came into the program and I was asking myself, is this just another sort of leadership training that we're going to do? But this one turned out to be different. Different in the sense that uh, right from the beginning of the program, there was that intent and it was so purposeful. Every day you are being told you are an African leader, you are a leader. And it was putting a lot of responsibility on us. So every day you go out, what can you do to improve the food system? What sustainability issue is there? What gender inclusion, environmental issues, and all that? So every day uh, you wake up and it's like, the rest of the people are looking at you as an African leader, trying to do something to improve the food system in Africa. So this was a huge uh, uh, conscientization, and that has made me to even move from my, the organization I was working in to a full private sector um, agri-production activity. So as we speak now, I'm no more in the ministry. I'm working on my own uh, uh, private business. In addition to that, the... Let's, yeah, please, you can go ahead and appreciate it. Yeah. Had it not been for this program, I'm not sure I'll be speaking with uh, former president of Nigeria, Obasanjo. I'm not sure I'll be speaking with Ndidi. Uh, I'll not be speaking with uh, the Zimbabwean president and all that. I remember during the last uh, summit, the opportunity was created. We have the chance... Uh, to meet all these leaders. I was able to speak with the IFAD, that's International Fund for Agricultural Development President. I shook hands, we discussed issues and all that. And all that really gave me that conscientization that, look, you are up there, you are a leader, you also have to make sure that you impact on the food system in Africa. So for me, in brief, this was the major outturn, apart from the network and the skills that we derive from the training program. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. If I may go to Anna, if you could. 
What has your experience been like? Uh, kindly share that. Uh, good evening. I'm Anna Mutinda. Um, when I joined the program, um, I was excited, very excited. But uh, when the program was presented and uh, I, I could see what is required of me, it was really intense. So this is to the third cohort. To those of us who are still excited. It is, in, yeah, I know they are very excited, especially after just joining, you are traveling to Dar es Salaam. Um, I'm still excited after graduation. Um, and what I learned from the program, uh, AMI and Kala are very supportive. They are always ready to respond to your issues. And so when you get stuck, just conduct them. They are very supportive. And the other thing is uh, look at the program very well and follow the guidelines, especially about how to implement the ALP, uh, starting with the problem identification, analysis, and all that. I can assure you, if you follow that, the journey will be very smooth. Uh, don't be tempted to, I'm talking to Code 2 3, don't be tempted to jump into solutions. Do a thorough problem analysis and also a solution analysis. And once you arrive at the correct intervention, it will be very easy. The other advice is uh, uh, you have stakeholders in the food system, and the challenge you'll be addressing, there are very many stakeholders. It's very undivisible that you already start consulting with them so that you don't come up with an intervention. And when it goes to the people who are supposed to help, if it's the small-scale farmers or the traders, they tell you, no, this is not our challenge. Our challenge is actually this one. So it's undivisible, you consult the, the stakeholders uh, early enough. I think those are some of the pitfalls that we fell into as a first cohort. Um, and uh, I think the second cohort is better undivised, because uh, I talked to some of them last as they were starting. And, uh, they are better prepared, and I believe cohort three, with us and now cohort two, they will be a better, better lot. They will be able to address the challenges that are facing their countries in a better and more sustainable way. And while on this, why are we doing all this? We want to see sustainable food systems in, our, in Africa, in our countries and in Africa. So as we even do the, our projects, uh, really let's look at how sustainable are the interventions that we are doing. And after we, we are through with the LP, is that the end of it? For us, um, as a Team Malaika in Kenya and also the other team transformation, we had two teams. Um, we are in the process of uh, combining efforts um, one of the teams we are looking at financing, and we all know that financing uh, in the agriculture uh, space is a big issue. So we are now uh, trying to put the financing. The other ones we are in the reducing waste in the food system. So we are trying to combine the two to come up with a program that will uh, address those challenges sustainably. Thank you so much. It's a very beautiful journey. Thank you. Thank you. Let's appreciate Anna. Mr. Francois, please, what has been your experience? Thank you. So probably I'm somehow different from others because I'm coming from business community. Okay. So when I joined this, I decided to apply for this course. My objective was to make more money 
how can I adjust my management to be able to make more money and to make it in a sustainable manner? A round of applause that for all was this honesty. The <laughs> objective. Yeah. But it was very ambitious because my company was very, very, very young, just five years, five years old. So I registered. I was admitted for the course, and we started by end August, September, like that. And when we started, and when I registered, I was just planning, or started to install my company in the second country, and said to be in Rwanda, go also to Central Africa Republic. I started some activities there. And the first challenge I faced is time. You know, business, there are some things that we are doing because I was involved in seed production, processing and marketing. Doing it on two countries, it, becomes, it became like difficult. And as you will see, this course is very, very, very tough. You have a course to do. You have like five quiz and the final exam. And there is another case that you have to submit, exercise. So the time was very, very limited for me. And the first decision I took is to stop Central Africa. And that comes from the course that I had for the first time, which is solving problem. From this course, I realized that I'm not on a good way. I have to spot one of my activities in Central Africa and concentrate first on this. And the course became day after day interesting. There was another thing, another course called influencing others. As a businessman, I said, how can I influence other people, other collaborators with other company to make again more money? I did it very fast. And it allowed me to partner with other company from Tanzania because I, faced a very, I was facing a very big problem to get other generation seeds, basic seeds. So immediately, I, I was being able to convince people from Tanzania to supply me those basic seeds. And the course was playing a very big role in my management. There is a lot of things that you will face, that you will see in this journey. I'm, tell, I'm just, this is particularly to the people in court one, court two, court three, that really are realities in our life. If you do business without collaborating with other, actually, in the world, you cannot be successful. Alone, you cannot go far. And that is the reality. Another element to be considered in our agriculture sector is agroecological consideration. I don't know if the professor Jean-Jacques is still here. I've been working with him in the past in the Ministry of Agriculture, and he's the one who was promoting soil fertility management. I said, no, use fertilizer from Ukraine, from other ways, and you will boost your production. You are losing time with compost. So with the course, we have been, we have been given the practical element that oriented me to that particular attention. And I've been capable to disseminate it among my collaborator. I have, now I'm collaborating with more than 3,000 farmers. I teach them to integrate that. And now we have doubled the yield. Wow. So for me, as a businessman, it is a very good journey because you manage where well your company, you do a proper planning, you collaborate with other people, 
company and your stakeholder like partners like farmers and then you achieve more yield achieving more yield you get better production yeah. you get more money and i'm sure you you make your business sustainable very thank good. you very much very good thank you so much and lastly on sharing your stories uh, grace I saw almost for everything you were saying, you kept nodding. <laughs> so we're waiting to hear about uh, <laughs> your experience. Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. So I would like to say it's an interesting journey. Um, a lot of learnings. They've said almost everything. I don't have to go over it. But one thing I can assure you is that you will become a better version of yourself. You will not only look at problems, but you will definitely see solutions beyond the problems that present themselves. And you'll be able to make system level changes. I've done several after the courses, after the experience with Kala. So I will just tell you to sit back, relax, and enjoy flight Kala 002 and 003 as it takes you to becoming a better version of yourself. Thank you. Very good. And now we'll take, no, just keep it there. I'm going to come back to you. So two things are going to happen. I want to just ask them some very specific questions. And then we will give a few minutes um, just to, if you have a question that's very specific that you'd like to ask one of the alumni, you can go ahead and do that. The first question I want to ask, though, just, I'll take maybe just three questions. Um, we've been talking about connecting and collaborating. Of course, one of our interests is, I mean, you're talk, Stephen was talking about meeting presidents, and all of us are saying, hey, Stephen, you are now a big man. <laughs> Who do we get to connect with? What has that experience been like in terms of connecting and also getting to collaborate? Um, maybe, Rachel, we can start with you. Just one or two people, Rachel and anyone else that may want to respond. Thank you, Samuel. Um in this journey of uh, becoming a transformational leader, you need to connect to people that are decision makers in your country. And uh, personally, um, when we started to work on these uh, regenerative agriculture uh, projects, we connected to people who actually have funding for these programs, number one. Number two, we now collaborate more with policymakers, especially the district officials, the district uh, local government um, uh, uh, officials in our country. These are very, very important because they, 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 they actually hold the levers of success in those uh, implementation areas. So that has been my, my experience with, um, with the, uh, um, connecting and also collaborating it is very difficult for you to make meaningful change in what you do, except if you collaborate with others. So we are working with the private companies. We are working with the um, institutions that we, we were never really working with in the previous past. But now, because of this issue of climate change that all of us are talking about, we have had to reach out to, to others to address the issue uh, of climate change, which is sector-wide for everyone. And so I encourage everyone um, in the action learning program, find the people that you need to connect to. And uh, feel free to reach out to the alumni in your country, because they too have connections, just like you have connections. Tap into the networks that are already available to you. Uh, because uh, uh, an alumni in your country, we were about, uh, I think, uh, 10 in uh, Uganda, that is cohort one, and all of us have networks. All you need to do is reach out to us, and uh, we are there, we can handhold you, we can let you know who you can collaborate with, and we can collaborate with you also, uh, as individuals, but also as institutions. Thank you. Good. Grace, can I ask you to, yeah. what's happening in, on the Nigeria side, in terms of connecting and collaborating? It's on. Yep. It's okay, on. so I um, I like to share about um, connection, partnerships, and all. 
Um, we identified where we're working. Oh, I didn't mention, I'm Grace, I'm the country project manager for Mennonites Economic Development Associates, so I work in the northeastern part of Nigeria. And one thing that was critical is for women not having access to any productive inputs, finance, and all of that. So what were we going to do about it? Uh, women came together to form the Apex Organization of Women SMEs, Women in Business, and they floated a microfinance bank by themselves, registered with Corporate Affairs Commission. So it's a system level changes. That's why I'm saying you, we will be a better version of ourselves, not making little uh, steps, but giant strands, you know. And we met the first lady, the wife of the governor of the state. She came and launched it, and um, talking about meeting ministers and wives of government officials, governors, and the likes. So it actually um, helps you to look beyond your former self <laughs> and do bigger things and system level uh, changes and influence. So I wanted to just share that, that that will be the first women owned, women led, and women um, facilitated microfinance bank in Northeast Nigeria, where women uh, actually experience a lot of gender norms, a lot of gender barriers, uh, but wow. it happened. Yeah, thank you. It's a big round of applause. That's an amazing feat. Yeah, very good. Um, on the other side, though, another person was asking, I would like to know, there's a lot of work to be done we have had. How do I balance this? It, we have, you've told us it is intense. Some practical tips because the journey gets hard and there's a lot more on our plates. It's not the one thing we're doing, we're doing many other things. How do we make sure we stay on the, on the road? Uh, maybe S Stephen, if you, if you don't mind. I'll hear from the two gentlemen on, on my side. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, personally, it was a bit difficult for me in the time management, but what I decided finally was that we have set up dates for our coaching. So I told myself, if the coaching session will be two hours. I'll dedicate at least one and a half hours after the coaching to go through the course item. So we normally start at 5 p.m. And so by 7, we are done. Then I stay over and then up to 8.39 to do the coursework and all that. So I dedicate that uh, three and a half hours of that weekly for the program. That was the um, the method I use. Oh, thank you. Um, as, as Steve told, said, um, when you look at uh, the, the time during the day, um, that's what I, I discovered, that I have to find a time when I'm more comfortable to do the coursework, uh, because sometimes when you're in the middle of uh, your normal day-to-day -day job, sometimes you've got tasks that you have to concentrate on and focus on. So. What I did was um, I had to find a consistent time uh, to be able to be doing my work, if one half hours to two hours every day. So um, I, I, I did that, and then I was making sure that uh, when I start a course, for example, a training, I'll make sure that um, uh, I finish it up quickly so that I don't you know, go back forgetting and then I re re retracting, trying to remember, recall. So I had a fixed time and try to finish a course when I start it completely and finish it and complete it. Um, the other things, for example, working in groups, um, we had to find a common time. Um, sometimes we had to agree at a very, very early time, for example, um, early in the morning, at 7, we had a coaching session. Sometimes we have coaching session at 6 p.m., so long as it's comfortable with the rest of the group. So we had to give, um, to understand what are the needs of the others, what are though, the uh, the schedules of other people and uh, working as a team because sometimes you have to give in and uh, give up some things for, in order for the group to thrive. So you have a group coaching session, uh, make sure that you plan properly and then you uh, have a specific time uh, that you agree with your team members to have a session. But if for your own, you make sure that you have a time that is consistent um, and then you get used to that as part of your time schedule. So um, that is how I kind of managed uh, my time. Uh, during this, because yes, they, they were intense, but they're not very difficult to do, but they're intense and very educative. 
Very good. Another round of applause, please. So at this point, I want to open it up a bit. If we can take just three questions. If we can take just three questions and then we finish. Two questions. <laughs> Two questions. All right. Two questions. Any hands up? And if you're feeling... Oh, yes, oh, there's a... Here just, is one. So we'll have two quick questions and just one answer for each, and then we'll finish. My name is Anasia Maleko from Tanzania. I just want to know, how did you manage your team dynamics? Question on managing team dynamics, and then the other question. Maybe we can, we, we can answer that. Then, uh, yes, someone has a question over here. I'm just going to pick only one person. If I have um, Grace, team dynamics, question on team dynamics, if you could respond to that in brief, and then last question, and then we'll close our session. Second question, please. Let's have a second question. Hello. Yes. For Team Ghana. So you were working with the public sector when you were doing your program. And with the knowledge you got, you moved into the private sector. So how did um, you uh, pull in all the resources and information to start a business on your own? I really want to understand how you did that. OK, very good. So a question on team dynamics, uh, Grace, if you would, briefly. And then uh, Team Ghana resources. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Beautiful question, because definitely it's not easy. We're not all in the same place, um, not even in the same town. So um, getting people together can be very tasking. But what we did, like um, he mentioned, we stayed up sometimes 7 p.m. after work to meet, you know, and discuss how we can move on, especially with our ALP. Uh, someone has to like kind of anchor certain parts of the activity. We had to share roles and responsibilities, and um, we had to be very intentional about it to ensure that everybody takes his or her role seriously. We, 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 we were checking on each other to ensure that you actually play your own role. So. Um, it's not, I can't tell you it's all easy, it's all rosy. You have family to deal with, some have children to deal with, you have your own work, daily schedules to deal with, and then you have to work with different personalities, different people. Some are slow, some are very fast. Um, so it's just about uh, being patient with everybody and trying as much as possible to carry everybody along. So eventually, we were able to navigate through, and we did our ALP and all of that. So it's possible, but uh, it needs a lot of patience and a lot of hand-holding. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And lastly, uh, Steve, comment on how do you get the resources together? Yeah, thank you very much. So it was an idea that was being, that was being incubated all along. But when I came here, I had the opportunity to meet um, Adefko. Adefko was here. And um, I spoke with Adefko, and I also spoke with uh, Indidi. She was here in the morning. And she told me that you can't be looking into one bottle with two eyes. Either you are here or there. So as part of the training program, there was this chapter that was about setting goals. So I told myself, within six months, I need to move no matter how small I was going to start. So that's how come I started uh, with my poetry program. I started with 1,500 bears in a very small structure. Uh, as we speak, uh, it has expanded more than uh, 10 times that. But I started on a very small note, and it was based on the training. We said set goals and make sure it's achievable, it's measurable, and then you have somebody who can relate to their goal and monitor you about that. So that was what I did. I just set the timeline and started on a very small note. Thank you. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly appreciate our alumni. Thank you for your words of encouragement and advice, and thank you for sticking with it. 16 months, it's not easy. It's been intense. 
But again, let's appreciate them. All right. And this, at this point, marks the end of our day. How do you feel? It's, has it been an intense day? On a scale of 1 to 10, where do you say? 12. <laughs> Especially with the walk to lunch and all that. Thank you so much for your involvement. Thank you for your engagement so much for today. Please rise, just stretch a little. And as soon as you're comfortable, you can just pick your property and we'll be off to the hotel. Mr. DJ, please play some music and we'll find our way. Thank you. A round of applause to you for being here today.